Have you ever been telling a story to someone who's never been to your house and in the middle of your story you pause and tell some detail about the location so that they can understand the story? Like, um, and then we went outside and you have to understand, like my house is on a hill so and it's really steep, it's like this. So then you finish your story, right? That information was important for that story so you included it and they didn't know it. But if you're telling the same story to your family or friends who've been to your house many times, you don't take that aside and tell them that extra information because they already know it. So when we're reading a Bible story, sometimes the location is very important. And often the writers don't include that information about the location because it was so obvious and common to their original readers. They would have known that geographical or location information. <clears throat> so sometimes it's vital to understand the geography to understand the story. Now I know what you might think, oh great, now we have to learn geography too. Well, a couple things about that. One, it's way easier than you think. And two, the truth is, yeah, you do need to know some basic geography about where the stories took place if you want to understand the stories. If you don't care about understanding God's Word, then you don't need to learn any geography. But it is important, and it's pretty simple. Here, you might have seen a map like this in the back of your Bible. It's Israel. And I'm going to show you a really simple exercise you can do to get familiar with the locations. You might think, I don't need this. but that's probably pride talking. I'm not going to go into details about why drawing a map helps you understand it more than just looking at it, but trust me, it does. So here we go. Just take out a sheet of paper, it's a little exercise, and pretend like this is your piece of paper. Don't draw a square. This is me just drawing your piece of paper. Um, so take out your sheet of paper, and the first thing to do is draw a tic-tac-toe kind of a division on it. Try to do it about you know, divide it into thirds as evenly as you can, but it doesn't have to be precise. And then again, divide it into thirds. Um, that line, a little high. I'll bring it down here a little bit. So this center square is going to be the map of Israel. So let's draw the coastline. Um, just take this line and with preferably a different color pen, but it doesn't matter. You just draw a little darker maybe. But um, just to the right of this, come down straight down there and then at this vertex when these lines come together just do a little whoop and that's Mount Carmel um, it just kind of juts out into the sea like that and then come down the rest of the way on the other side just a little left of that um, and then right when you get down to here just do a little swooping motion out there so now you've got the Mediterranean Sea drawn fairly accurately with Mount Carmel right there. Now, over here, you might be familiar with the Sea of Galilee and the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Those are the three bodies of water in Israel. Um, <clears throat> so basically, right at this vertex where the Sea of Galilee is, just draw a little raisin right there, and then a little rope hanging down to this vertex, and then a little peanut. So you got a raisin, rope, and peanut map which is the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. The Dead Sea is the lowest point on Earth, so that's why water flows out of one sea and into another sea. Uh, it wouldn't make a lot of sense in many situations, but in this situation, um, this uh, is a low point for this region, but this is the low point of the whole Earth, so water's flowing down there. So right there, you've drawn the map of Israel. So for the rest of your life, you're reading a story and it says, um, they were on the, the east side of the Jordan, over here, and they crossed over into the land. Oh yeah, that makes sense. I understand that. I can picture that. So it's pretty simple. And later, after you're very familiar with this, you can add in more details such as on this line, um, about a third of the way over to the sea, you've got Jerusalem, the capital. And, you know, more places like that. But that's the basic map. And just getting that in your mind, especially if you're drawing it yourself, you do that a couple times, is really going to help you understand a lot of the stories in the Bible. So, now that you're familiar with the layout of Israel, let's zoom out so you can see where Israel is in the world. Obviously, you've got Italy in the west, and then Greece 
<clears throat> with all those little islands, that little peninsula there. And then Turkey. Um, and in the south, you can see the Nile River, which is in Egypt. Then there's Israel in the little red box. It's a very small place. I mean, the whole country is 40 miles wide. You could ride a bicycle across the whole country in one afternoon. Then just to the east of Israel is the Arabian Desert. And above that is Iraq. You can see the Tigris and Euphrates rivers, which dump into the Persian Gulf. So God chose to put his people in this place. Why? Well, let's look at some of its features. Israel is the land between. Between what? Well, there's three pairs of things that Israel is in between. <clears throat> First, geographically, it's between Africa and Asia. It's the bridge between those two continents. And it's a narrow bridge because of the second pair. Secondly, and it's a climactic pair, Secondly, it's between the sea and the desert. Israel is a bottleneck for people traveling from Asia to Africa, which means that all trade goes right through Israel. The point is that there is major cultural influence happening, and it could have gone either way. Israel could have been a light to the nations, a kingdom of priests, for the rest of the world, but sadly, they were the ones who were influenced. And then the third and final pair, politically, they were right between the two superpowers of the ancient world, Egypt and Mesopotamia. Now, I use the term Mesopotamia because at different times, the land between the rivers was controlled by different groups, like Babylon, later Persia, but there was always a superpower in that region. And then Egypt was the superpower on the other side. So Israel was constantly changing allegiance. They were interacting with Egypt and Mesopotamia, making alliances and treaties, fighting battles against Mesopotamia side by side with the Egyptians. Other times they were fighting battles against Egypt side by side with the Mesopotamians which means even more opportunity to be influenced. They were constantly tested. Are you going to act like the rich and powerful people around you, or are you going to act the way God told you to act? Are you going to fear their powerful armies, or will you fear God? Are you going to trust in their powerful armies when they promise to protect you, or will you trust God? and his promises of protection. So that's a bit about the land of the Bible. Let me end by going through the Old Testament history chart that I've talked about the last two weeks. But this time, I'm going to go through that chart from a geographical point of view. So it starts over here in Babylon. Abraham grew up here. Babylon is the land where people want to make a name for themselves. Remember the Tower of Babel? Babel is the same word as Babylon. They want to use their own power and ingenuity and technology to reach the heavens. And God calls Abraham out of that land, over to here, Israel. Of course, <clears throat> of course um, at this time, it was called Canaan. And he lived there. He had a brief stint in Egypt, but then he came back to the land God had promised him, and he died there. His sons, Isaac and Ishmael, buried him with Sarah, his wife, Isaac's mother. Then Isaac had Jacob, and Jacob had Joseph, and Joseph went to Egypt and ended up becoming the prime minister of one of the two world superpowers. So eventually, all 70 of Jacob's family members went to live with him in Egypt. But after Joseph's death, the Egyptians enslaved the Jews. <clears throat> then after 400 years, Moses led them out of Egypt. Eventually, he led them all the way to the west side of the Jordan. They were just about to get into the land that God had promised their ancestor Abraham, and that's where Moses died. So then all they had to do was cross the Jordan, 
and they were back in the land God had promised Abraham, their forefather. And they lived there for 400 years under the leadership of judges. But after 400 years of that, they wanted to be like the other nations, so they asked Samuel to appoint a king for them. This started the 400-year monarchy. Pretty soon, they split into two nations, but they stayed in their land. However, because they kept worshiping other gods, they got captured by Babylon and taken into exile over here in Babylon. This lasted about 70 years, and in the post-exile, they came back and rebuilt Jerusalem and their temple to God. That was the same temple that Jesus went to, some of which you can still see today. The exile cured them of idol worship, which is why it's a non-issue in the New Testament. But they found other sins, less obvious sins, greed and pride, sins of the heart, which are the deadliest kind. It's important to remember that internal sins are deadlier because other people can't see them, and that makes it easier for me to not see it in my own heart. How many have seen a drug addict and thought, there but for the grace of God go I. Thank you, God, that I am not like that. Sounds good. It sounds humble and righteous. But do you realize that you're acting a lot like the Pharisee who prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Jesus said, I tell you that this man the tax collector, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Now, he was actually thanking God, but he was thanking God that he was so good. Do you realize that when you say, thank you, God, that I'm not as bad as him, you're wrong. You should say, he's a sinner with cocaine, and I'm a sinner with greed. He's a sinner with heroin, and I'm a sinner with pride. And which is worse? Which is worse? The pride is worse. That's why we should all say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Thank you, Jesus, for getting punished for my sins. Thank you, Jesus, for making me clean by your blood, by dying for me. Thank you, Jesus. So, when we're reading the Bible, <clears throat> So, when the Bible was written, so when we're reading the Bible, so when we're reading a Bible story, but it, <clears throat> you're probably familiar <clears throat> here. You've probably seen a map like this in <clears throat> here. You might have seen a map. You might think, I don't need this. <clears throat> so, so, so. So it's pretty simple. So it's pretty simple. Politically, they were, Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. So 
it's pretty, uh, the Dead Sea is the lowest point on earth. Um, I'm not going to go into details about why drawing a map, ha <coughs> I'm not, I'm not going to go into details about, I'm not going to go into 